Um, welcome to this concept bag about thermodynamics. Um, here I'm going to talk about the link between degrees of freedom in uh, a molecule and the heat capacity um, using equipartition theory. So every atom has three degrees of freedom. They're essentially up, down, um, left, right, and forward, back. And just like energy, angular momentum, degrees of freedom must be conserved. So if I start having more than one atom put together to make a molecule, I have to conserve the total degrees of freedom. Now for linear molecules, uh, by the time I make the molecule, I still have three translational degrees of freedom. I now have two rotational degrees of freedom. And I have a number of vibrational degrees of freedom, which depend upon the number of atoms in my molecule. So here in my case of this diatomic molecule, I have um, two atoms, so 3n minus 5 is 1. I have one vibrational degree of freedom. For nonlinear molecules, I have um, three translational degrees of freedom. I have three rotational degrees of freedom. And I have 3n minus 6 vibrational degrees of freedom. So here in my example of water, I have um, 3 times 3 minus 6, or 3 vibrational degrees of freedom for water. So just to kind of summarise some of that, so if I take my molecule, if I take an atomic molecule, so an atom, neon has one atom, uh, and it has its three translational degrees of freedom, nitrogen, a diatomic gas, um, is linear, it has three translational, two rotational, one vibrational degree of freedom, water, as I've just said, three translational, three rotational, three vibrational, carbon dioxide, it's got three atoms, but it's linear, so it's got three translational, two rotational, and four vibrational. Ammonia, um, I'm starting to increase my number of atoms, and you can see what's essentially happening is I'm just increasing the number of vibrations that are available to it. So acetylene, again, it's linear, and here I have um, methane. So it's just looking at a variety of small molecules and their degrees of freedom. Now, how does this relate to heat capacity? So equipartition theory says that for every translational degree of freedom, I contribute one half R to the heat capacity. For every rotational degree of freedom, I contribute one half R to the heat capacity. And for every vibrational degree of freedom, I contribute R to the heat capacity. Now, these are all heat capacity at constant volume. So here I have just have some values of the heat capacity of some monatomic and diatomic gases. I can see that for my monatomic noble gases, my heat capacity at constant volume is identical for all of them. 12.472 joules per kelvin per mole. It's not quite so perfect for my diatomic gases. If I actually work out five halves R, uh, it's 20.7879 um, joules per kelvin per mole. Um, and my values aren't quite this. And so what is going on? Why that very, very subtle difference between um, my heat capacity predictions from equipartition theory and what's actually going on. So here I have a, um, a plot to show the variation of heat capacity at constant volume of molecular hydrogen. And we can see at very, very low temperatures, it's pretty much bang on this three halves R. And then I get to a certain temperature and it increases until it's about five halves R and then it increases again. But we're now talking for this to be at temperatures much, much higher than um, room temperature. You can see that it's about 1,000 Kelvin before I even start to see this ramp up to the seven halves R that equipartition theory would predict. Well, this is to do with the energy levels within the system. Now, we should recall that translational energy levels are very, very close together. The next lowest energy levels and the next closest energy levels together are rotational. And vibrational energy levels are usually quite far apart and are usually not terribly well occupied at room temperature. And this is the key. At low temperatures here, my contribution is from my translational energy levels. And so my heat capacity only has 
um, input from the translational energy levels, the only energy levels which are occupied. As I increase my temperature, I start to occupy those rotational levels, and that's why at room temperature those heat capacities are around five halves R. Some of them are a little bit lower because we haven't potentially kind of occupied those levels um, to their fullest extent. As I increase the temperature still further, I start to activate that vibrational level. And so that's the difference here. Equipartition theory isn't clever enough in itself to know when we're occupying different levels. And so it kind of helps to justify as a backtrack method. But it's interesting all the same, and that can actually make some fairly good predictions. So if I take this further, equipartition theory for uh, carbon dioxide would say that my heat capacity should have the contributions from the translations, the rotations, and the vibrations, which should give me a heat capacity somewhere around 13 halves R at constant volume. And just recall that the heat capacity at constant pressure um, is the heat capacity at constant volume plus R. And so this is saying my heat capacity at constant pressure should be around 15 halves R, so 62 um, joules per Kelvin per mole. Now at 15 degrees C, we um, see a heat capacity of just 36 uh, joules per Kelvin per mole, but that increases uh, to be much more in line with what equipartition theory would be predicting if we increase this temperature all the way up to 2000 degrees C. And so it's just about this occupation of energy levels. So much of thermodynamics depends upon our energy levels within our system, and this is just another case of what's going on. So thank you for listening. I hope it has helped. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment or to contact me.